nehmen. Jetzt machen wir aber without further ado weiter mit unserem nächsten Panel. Wir haben jetzt eine Stunde Zeit für eine Debatte hier auf der Bühne, hier im Saal und ähm, wir werden ja auch im Livestream verfolgt, also auch an unsere Zuschauer außerhalb des Saales äh, nochmal das, das Thema. Es geht um den Kalten Krieg 2.0. Es geht um Russland und den Westen in der, im Zeitalter neuer Aufrüstung. Und da wir das Körper History Forum sind und nicht eine Sicherheitskonferenz, geht es uns um die Leitfrage, inwiefern hilft uns die Beschäftigung mit der Geschichte des Kalten Krieges dabei, die Konfrontationen von heute zwischen Russland und dem Westen zu verstehen. Das ist eine offene Frage und wir hoffen, Antworten zu bekommen darauf von René Nüberg, dem ehemaligen Botschafter Finnlands in Berlin und Moskau und von Maxim Trudolyubov, Senior Fellow am Cannon Institut, Journalist und Autor bei Viedomosti und natürlich mit dem Blog, Blog The Russia Files. Und moderiert wird das Panel von Judy Dempsey, Non-Resident Senior Fellow bei Carnegie Europe und Chefredakteurin des Blogs Strategic Europe. So. Die Bühne ist Ihre und wir freuen uns auf die Debatte. Vielen Dank. Okay. Really, 12 o'clock? Hmm? 12 o'clock, sharp? Yeah. Okay. It's not a special <coughs> minutes, but... Yeah. <coughs> uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, Thank you for coming to the next session, and I hope you're enjoying the, the history form. Actually, it's really good that the weather is very hot, that, because you'll stay in here, it's nice and cool. <laughs> <laughs> But I hope, uh, I hope you'll in, in, really, um, I look forward to this debate, and I look forward to your participation, which we will open it up 20 minutes before. So, uh, Cold War, two, two, point nil. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to predict the, um, the World Cup in Russia, but uh, it'll be very interesting to even ask, I'll start with you, René, given your long experience as a diplomat, um, I mean, why are we discussing this, this Cold War? Is it really relevant, a new Cold War? Well, I, I think it's not. <laughs> I don't think it's a Cold War. I think it's a misnomer. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a convenient way of, of trying, to, trying to have an, uh, have an have a picture which you can you can work on but it really isn't i mean the cold war was very different it was there were there were ideologies there were and there was there were, there were huge armies remember that 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 uh, 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 the, uh, the, the Soviet army in, in Eastern Germany was almost 500, 500,000, half a million men, and, 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 the, and uh, American, uh, American troops was, were, I mean, 300,000, something like that. Uh, I remember when I arrived in, uh, as, a, as a DCM, as the uh, number two at the embassy in Bonn in 91 in, in January, I landed in Frankfurt, and I saw, saw the, the, uh, I mean, I don't know how many, Uh, galaxy C5s, and, and that was that was the beginning of the <clears throat> war in the in the Gulf, and they were transporting American troops out of Germany, which never returned. Before I, I get to Maxim, but then why is this new Cold War being banded about? <laughs> it's journalistic. <laughs> well, it's it's academic as well. I mean, they're academics. Uh, but it's, uh, it's very journalistic. Well. It's sketchy. Mm -hmm. It's catchy. Of course, the situation is bad. I mean, the relations are bad. You have you have tensions. You have, yeah, you have issues. But but a cold war in the sense. Uh, I mean, uh, just think about what what mm. cold war was. There was there was there was a real enmity and there were mm -hmm. real confrontations. Although the cold war at the end was very much a proxy yes. war, we have proxy wars going on now. Yeah. <coughs> Maxime, I can't I can't decide where you stand after reading so many of your, of your writings. Um, do, do you think this, the term, even a new Cold War, is applicable, or should, or should we just get back to describing what is the nature of the relationship between the West and Russia? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it probably re reflects the fact that we are looking for a way of, of describing it, and, it, and we don't know. Uh, and uh, and uh, as I'm a journalist, so I will, <laughs> and for, uh, just for, for the sake of a difference, I will try and defend. <laughs> Uh, you know, the Cold War, uh, the, the actual Cold War, or Cold War I, uh, was, um, uh, was an international system, right? Uh, it was a, a system of relationships and uh, foreign policies of 
of dozens uh, of countries were formed in, yeah. some, in some relationship to, to this great divide. Um, and there was a cause there, apparently, uh, uh, regardless of how many people actually believed in, in defending it, but there was a cause. I mean, there were mm -hmm. uh, emblems and flags, and uh, there were people marching on either side. And, but um, right now, we ha we, if we call it a Cold War, let's just, because we haven't mm -hmm. come up with you know, too lazy to come up with uh, something uh, nicer. Uh, I mean, there, there's not there, no cause. It's, it's like a, a war without a cause. And and uh, also one 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 more point: the the act, Cold War One uh, produced a number of outcomes. Yes, I was going to get to this. And uh, those outcomes were significant uh, for for the entire world. And uh, out of Cold War One. The United States emerged as the, uh, finally, the, the sort of the sole uh, superpower <clears throat> and, and sort of, uh, you know, a, a victorious uh, system, uh, which they first celebrated and then it, it, where we are now, right? So, and if we try and imagine what kind of outcomes Cold War II would produce, I would start with uh, things like, you know, disdain for truth. Yeah. Uh, complete, you know, relativity of mm. all kinds of values, you know, these kinds of things. Let me get, go back to the historical aspect, which I think is quite important. I mean, as a child and later as a teenager and then a journalist growing up in the Cold War, um, there was a certain predictability about it. And I don't want to push the, 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 this element, but both sides more or less knew where they stood. And when the solidarity trade mo movement um, developed in Poland, I remember Western leftists really disliked it because it would upset the status quo. Mm -hmm. And so there was this kind of stability, I use a very important, uh, this word very carefully, in, in equilibrium. But what, what we have now, if we don't use Cold War II, we have unpredictability, I've made a list here, we have unpredictability, we have rivalry, we have distrust, we have disinformation, we have bitterness, we have fear, lack of predictability, competition, World inferiority complex, lack of respect, arrogance. And so we, we still have the nuclear arms issue. We still have, we still have, uh, a, a, a two powers, two powers, the United States and, 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 and the Russian Federation, which can annihilate each other. And, and this has not gone, gone away. We forgot, we, we, mm -hmm. it, it, we, at our own peril, we forget about the nuclear aspect. This, is, this doesn't fit into our worldview of, of, uh, of peace and of, of harmony. Which, is, which, is, yeah. which isn't there, but after, uh, after the Cold War was ended. Mm. And this is something which is the military aspect, it should not be forgotten. <laughs> Ivan Krasov made an interesting, he didn't talk about Russia much, actually by, bypassing on mentioned Russia, but he mentioned the military aspect in Europe. The military aspect still plays a role. Yes, but Europe, as, as uh, Krastev also said, was, is Europe uh, able to defend itself without the American security guarantee? I want to go to back to this aspect of the Cold War. You could argue that the Cold War does continue in the sense that you have two nuclear powers. Yes. And you have, under, under, the former, uh, under the former Bush administration, you had walking away from, from, the, from various missile accords, tearing them up. And you had the Russians walking away from the conventional forces in Europe. That's true. That's and true. and in, in some ways, the ebbing of the, of the Cold War in the, say, the 80s, it's the 70s and 80s, it brought disarmament. It brought an element of detente. And above all, it brought the Helsinki Final Act. And yet now, with Georgia, 2008, Crimea, 2014, and Eastern Ukraine, the very basis of the Helsinki Final Acts, the inviolability of borders, has been torn up. So if the old Cold War, the rules have been torn up, what do we have instead? Well, um, you see, the Cold War was a bipolar system. And uh, today we have anything but. I mean, uh, what it is, it's definitely not a bipolar uh, thing. And, uh, uh, Ot <clears throat> uh, Arni Wester, the historian who wrote the book uh, about, uh, about the Cold War, uh, 
he, he makes this, uh, I think, a, a good point that um, bipolar systems are actually rare uh, in history. And uh, you, you have to go back to uh, the rivalry between Spain and England probably uh, back in the, you know, 15, uh, in the 1500s, uh, 16th uh, century, to, to find something uh, similar. So, um, <clears throat> it, it's, and now it's definitely not a bipolar thing. And uh, it, it kind of repeats because, I mean, there are lots of people around who, who, who were cold warriors during mm -hmm. uh, Cold War War. They're still around, many yes. of them. And, and, uh, and, and they're actually running Russia. Uh, uh, so on the Russian side, it's 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 a very familiar it's a very familiar environment for them. But the actual picture of the world doesn't really fit. It's it's. Uh, I mean, we have China for God's sake. Mm. I mean, it's uh, is it part of the Cold War uh, too? I mean, uh, if anything, China is on the winning side uh, of this Cold War too, j simply because it's not taking part in it. And it's still red China. <laughs> yeah. Well, red or. Uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of... Uh... Before we deal with China, in fact, I don't think we are going to deal with China, um, I, I, this, this um, relationship between Russia and the West, where does, what is this relationship, Rene? Well, you, you mentioned the Helsinki Accords, and it was, it, was, it was actually funny what you said. You said that uh, unviolability of borders. If we think about the audience, what do you think about Helsinki Accords? We all remember human rights. That's right. We all remember the third best. Mm -hmm. And people even don't even remember what the, that, what the, the uh, federal government of Germany insisted on in the, in the, in the uh, drafting and negotiations on the final act, uh, of Helsinki Final Act. They insisted on the right that you can change borders peacefully. That was one of the big things. That was the thing for, for Western Germany, uh, Helmut Schmidt, before they agreed to join, uh, to, 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 to accept the uh, final accords. Uh, and now this is the issue. But what, what happened in Crimea was, was, was you changed borders, but you changed it by force. Oh, it could take Georgia also, mm -hmm. especially Crimea. And, and this is a, print issue, a principal issue. I just wanted to mention that because, because uh, mm -hmm. one of a sudden the Helsinki Accords look, diff look different yes. today than they... Yeah, one forgets this point, one, and peacefully yeah. as well. Yeah. I, I take this point, but we shouldn't forget the huge human rights dimension, which really gave huge... Um, credibility to, to the, oh, yes. to the it, distance. But at the same time, Leonid, Leonid Brezhnev uh, signed, the, uh, signed the death warrant of, of the Soviet system. Yeah. There's no me, question about let that. Me go back I mean, to, Reni, let me go back to my question. 75. Uh, let me go back to my question. What then, what then is this relationship between Russia and the West? It's, it's love and hate. There's a, uh, uh, Russia has been, uh, has been uh, westernizing itself more than 300 years. Uh, I, I mean, uh, I mean uh, you know, uh, Peter, mm -hmm. Peter, Catherine, mm -hmm. uh, uh, both Alexanders, uh, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and of course, of course the, the Bolsheviks were very much westernizers, I mean, in, in, in their own, own, uh, own way. Uh, you couldn't, couldn't really call Stalin a Westerner. Mm -hmm. That's another thing. And so, so, in a way, it's been Russia has been uh, is been trying to uh, trying to to, to 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 modernize itself. But actually, I mean, what did Peter do? Peter copied the Swedish and Danish system of of uh, administration. Uh, 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 the, uh, and the rest, I mean, just look at, the, look at German, uh, Russian history. It's full of, mm. it's full of, of, of German, Dutch influence and later French influence. So uh, this is, this is a, you opened a big box now. Yeah, I've opened a big box, but I'm not going to have it too big because I know exactly where you're, what you might like to jump into and pick out. Um, but Maxime, this, this modernization, this westernization, um, I want to go back to, again to this question, what is this relationship? Rene says the long three, 300 years of, of westernization, of modernization. And then we have the slowdown of the modernization. And, um, and we have this example of, of the former foreign minister Steinmeier going off to Ekaterinburg and giving this huge speech in 2005 or 2006, or maybe his third term. And we'll help you modernize, but modernization is inevitably linked to political liberalization. What, 
how do you see then this 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 impulse on Russia? Does it is 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 the relationship between the West and Russia no longer based on modernization, or is it based on competition? Uh, well, you see, R uh, Russia actually is is I would call Russia a world champion in modernization in terms of uh, Russia has been modernizing for centuries, and it's it's kind of a national idea in a way. Uh, because you, uh, Russia moves in jumps, right? It, it, we always have a period of stagnation, and then uh, somebody, real, a new czar, realizes that uh, Russia is way behind, and we have to, uh, you know, and we have to modernize. And and usually, and, 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 and this is a constant in uh, Russian history, actually. Uh, Russia's rulers all, are always has, has always been ambitious very ambitious for, for the past 500 years, since the Moscow state's been formed. And, uh, but they never had enough. Uh, their economy was, has, has always been backward. So, and this, this has produced this constant conflict. You, you, had to, you had to be a world-class power, to be a, a power on par with, with the biggest <coughs> power at the time, but you never had enough money. Uh, and this, and, and this is, I mean, Stalin is one of those figures, mm. actually. He was a big modernizer. Uh, regard, uh, I mean, uh, we, we just, you know, put as, put, putting aside the values, the, mm. uh, he was a modernizer. That's the way he saw himself. But um, today's Russia is also a modernizing power, as always. It's just modernizing itself in a kind of different way. And uh, I will just uh, mm -hmm. point out this uh, funny aspect of, uh, of Russian politics. Uh, Putin has been sponsoring uh, modernizing programs, reform programs, like for, for the, his entire term in power, for the past almost soon 20 years. We had at least three big reform programs. Mm -hmm. They're all in his drawers and somewhere mm -hmm. in his desk. And, um, and right now, he's after this so-called election, he's, he has this, uh, the latest program written by Alexei Kudrin, a, a respected former uh, finance minister who, who, who produced two years, they worked for two years and produced a thorough, a very, very good program, actually. Uh, if, we, if, if, if it's published and you'll be able to review it, you'll love it. It's a, it's a very good institutionally minded mm -hmm program of institutional change. Mm -hmm. And of course, it will end up in the same drawer yeah. in, the Putin, uh, in yes. Putin's desk. So Putin is a, a, a kind of a reverse modernizer, or he's pre he's, he, pretends, he pretends to keep a, mod a modernization mm. program. But, and he tells everybody, and he says, I have Alexei Kudrin mm -hmm. you know, next, yeah. sitting next to me. But uh, his actual program is, is different, yeah. and but, 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 his but, actual it, it's also, I think, he thinks about it in, a, 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 in probably in modernizing terms. But uh, what he's been doing, I mean, look at least at this aspect. Uh, Russia, when he when he arrived, Putin arrived. Uh, Russia had a private, privately owned enterprises and mm -hmm. uh, and, and an economy that could be called a market economy with a certain stretch. Uh, but uh, right now, it's completely, almost completely nationalized. Mm -hmm. It's a very strange beast mm. because it's more than 70% controlled by the state. And even the part that is actually pri privately owned is not really privately yeah, owned. Yes. Yeah. Brenny, you wanted I, to come I, in? I, I, I do not disagree. Uh, uh, Putin started as a, as, a, as a very dynamic modernizer. We'll think about the Gref program and all of that. Uh, uh, I still remember sitting in the office of, of German Gref, he was then the Minister of Economy, I had with me a Finnish delegation. We commented uh, uh, a, a law on, 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 uh, on, uh, on the forest forestry, how you privatize forest land, and how you were able to use that. And, and we, we, I mean, we worked, this was a request by the Russian government, by Gref personally, uh, and, and we did that. Most of the things we, we recommended were adopted, but not all. So in a way, there was a very dynamic per, uh, 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 period. For example, the taxation system was, was changed. I mean, uh, uh, you could, you could, you could uh, uh, own land and, and, and all of that. And then, uh, 
abruptly mm. all of this stopped. It was partly after the uh, arrest of Khodorkovsky. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, then, and then something, something happened, which I would call the arrogance of the oil price. Mm. That, that destroyed a lot That's of that. Interesting. But, mm. but what Steinmeier said in 2005 mm -hmm. was exactly what the Finnish government said at that moment. Mm -hmm. We are your partner yeah. in modernization. And if you look at that, if you look at the world, the United States is not, was not interested in being a modernization partner of Russia. Mm -hmm. China was, was, it, it plays a different game. The only ones, were, it, was, it was Europe, it was Germany, very much Finland, we were doing a lot and we've done a lot. And, and this period is kind of the one which many, many of us would have to see come back, but. Yeah. Why, did, why was it rejected? Why was the Finnish the, and the German support rejected? Yeah, uh, I mean, f uh, that too, this, is, this gets, gives, get, gets us into the real issue. The first one was the arrogance of the oil, uh, of the oil price. I mean, it, it, it destroyed the, it mm. just destroyed yes. the, the uh, yes. many things. And the second one was that, at, uh, that uh, Russian rulers, especially Putin, realized that, uh, that uh, the system will not, his system will not be able to turn into a uh, system of rule of law. Mm. Uh, uh, when you violate property rights the way you violated that with Yukos, uh, Hodorkovsky 2003, uh, uh, I mean, you, you all, uh, it was a big step back where, where, where property is not guaranteed, uh, you, are not the, you are not the owner of, of something you, you're supposed to own, you're, you have a right to manage it. Uh, it's, the, in, it, it's the same thing you had in the mm. GDR. People bought, mm. people bought houses mm. and they thought that they were the owners of that house. Mm. Yeah. But it turned out that they were not in the Grundbuch. That's so right. actually the owner was sitting in New York yes. or in Hamburg uh, and, and, and they lost their property. Yes. So this is the, the guarantee of property, rule of law. And, and this is something which the present Russian system, uh, system could not uh, could not uh, uh, adopt mm -hmm. because the system would mm -hmm. not take it. I don't want to be, uh, th thank you for this reminder, Rene. I don't want to be naive, but you could argue that this, um, the, the increasing power of the state, the disregard for the rule of law, despite what was like in the Soviet in constitution, the disregard for property rights, it's very important. I mean, in, in some ways, uh, there are remnants of the, of the Soviet version of the Cold War still lingering. Well, you see, uh, the way, uh, apparently, the way the Kremlin sees uh, its current version of modernization is uh, that you have to adopt, you have to cherry pick, you have to be smart. Because if you, if you, if you with, with the technical part, if you take the institutional part, you kind of surrender, uh, uh, surrender to, uh, to the West. Mm -hmm. Because the institutional part, that includes the rule of law mm -hmm. and competition um, and all these nice things and uh, media freedom. Uh, if you take this, this is, I mean, the Kremlin says this. I mean, are we, are we that stupid? So we, we, you know, we take all this and then they all come, you know, and they take our, I mean, they basically, they conquer us. We adopt their system. So this is the kind of thinking. So this, uh, the, the institutional part of the modernization, the way, we, uh, the way it's described in uh, you know, the, this institutional thinking that is very uh, common in the West, if you take, you know, look at, looking at, at history in retrospect, you mm -hmm. see this institutional development, you know, starting with the, uh, with, I don't know, England, uh, you know, uh, uh, th th this conflict between the, the monarchy and the landowning, uh, landowning mm. um, class. And then gradually you have this, you know, the independent court system, et cetera, et cetera. So this is the model that, the, that Putin and the current Kremlin specifically rejects. Yeah. They don't believe in, in this, they don't want to adopt it, and they, they mm -hmm. sort of, they actively uh, disagree. 
But they do want all the technical stuff. They, they want the iPhones, they want yes. the, the guns, obviously. I mean, the yeah. first the guns, then the iPhones and everything. So, so that's, uh, that's nice I mean, that's, that's a very consistent worldview, by and the way. Espresso word. coffee and all that. But, yeah. um, uh, but of course. Yeah. But um, Maxime, you're getting to a really important point here. I, I don't know if you heard Ivan Krastev last night. Sure. And he made this point between the, the East Europeans want to imitate uh, the West, the, the imitators and the imitators. And I was wondering, and he demolished it really, really nicely now, given what's happening in, in Poland and Hungary and some other countries. But um, he made the point that Russia actually wants to imitate the West on Russia's terms, whether it's, um, whether it's election monitors or how they, how they to influence and everything. What do you think, how do you think Russia really now sees the West? Uh, I go back to my original list. I mean, there's this there's, there's, there's disinformation, there's the lack of predictability, inferiority complex, lack of respect, arrogance. I mean, it could cut both ways. Uh, well, you see, <clears throat> I think that if we, if we come back to uh, the Cold War uh, analogy, I think that the Cold War thinking is actually very convenient mm. for Russia and for the Kremlin because uh, it gives you this very familiar, fr for them, it gives a very familiar framework. I mean, if I were in the Kremlin, I would probably do that too because it's, it's, it's a really nice way of, uh, of presenting the situation for the Russian public and uh, you present yourself as, as a warrior against the, uh, the arrogant aggressive West that wants to conquer or penetrate you from, from everywhere. So, so it's a very convenient worldview for Moscow. Let, let me go back to, to what, what, uh, what uh, Max said before about that if we would allow them, they would conquer us. They would, if we would take the, uh, if we'd go their way, they would conquer us. Russia was dirt poor. Uh, after the Soviet Union collapsed. It had, of course, enormous reserves. Some of them were scandered, some of them were stolen, some of them were just uh, d disappeared. And, and the question was how to invest. And Yeltsin was dead against, and so was Chubais. Some of the ol uh, later oligarchs had another opinion. Should we allow Western capital to, uh, to enter, enter Russia? If we talk about the, I mean, 1995 is a decisive year because that's when the when uh, shares of shares for loans, the the, the great uh, privatization took part, which which uh, which superficially looks like a haste, but it was it was it was more. I mean, uh, I mean, uh, discrept, uh, absolutely abandoned industries were given to for a song to to to, to oligarchs yeah. who built them up, yeah. and they really built them up. Now, you could have done that with letting, uh, letting uh, Western capital come in and do the same thing. This was done in the uh, electricity uh, reform of, uh, uh, of Anatoly Chubais. It is the only real successful reform of the Putin era. Mm. That is the privatization of the utilities and, and, and it, it is a, it's actually a great success story because I remember working a lot with Russia and Russian economy at, at, at those years. You had a list of cities in Russia which faced the, faced the risk of a brownout. Yes. For example, St. Petersburg faced the risk of brownout, which, which was something which concerned Finland. Uh, had there been a, minus th a week of minus 30, they would have cut their export of electricity, etc. Nothing of this is there. I mean, the privatization of the energy, energy um, generation mm. industry is a great example. And, and, the, and most of the, if, uh, the bulk of the, uh, of, of, the, of the investments came from the West. Mm -hmm. indeed. So you could have done yes. it in the 90s also. Yes, in indeed. I want to, um, I, I, I find, this, I find this, um, this relationship very, very complicated and fraught with very different perceptions. And when you read Putin's inauguration speech, I found it actually quite defensive. We're going to do this for the, for the public, we're going to improve um, standards, etc., etc. And I got the feeling that all is not well with the, the Russian economy. And my question is this, um, we saw the deterioration of the Russian economy, the slow gradual deterioration in the 70s and 80s, and 
as that deteriorated, Afga they invaded Afghanistan. We know how that was a big mess. Do you think um, the foreign policy, um, that Russia's foreign policy, as in Georgia, Syria, uh, relations with uh, selling stuff to Turkey, uh, the, the special air, air fighters, um, uh, Crimea, of course, is this, is this um, a serious foreign policy or is, is it strategic? Or is it tactical to divert people's attentions away from the corruption of what else is happening in Russia? Well, I, I, I'm, I mean, it, it, it probably is both, uh, and, and there are lots of other things too. Uh, um, I don't think that Putin's been, you know, sitting there, this, you know, thinking, why don't I invade uh, Crimea to detract to distract people's attention? I don't think. Uh, I mean, he apparently that's the way uh, the Kremlin, that's the way the Kremlin sees the world in very um, in, in, in in these terms of of uh, conflict, and uh, apparently he felt. I mean, that's the the way we uh, explain this back, you know, in in Russia that he felt that uh, Ukraine, the Ukraine Revolution, and the mm. Uh, the uh, when the president fled, it was a, it was a U.S. Uh, supported plot, yeah. and uh, it was a blow against Putin himself, against mm. Moscow. So it, it was like almost a military aggression against Russia. Mm. Uh, that's Ukraine, that's yeah. that's the way uh, Moscow was mm. reading it, and still r is reading it. And and the thing is, we don't know to what extent this was sincere. sincere. It, uh, I, I always had this impression that it was kind of a worked up uh, behavior, like you basically, you uh, persuade yourself that you are being attacked and then act as if you are being attacked. Mm. But, I mean, it doesn't really matter in the end because I, Putin ended up uh, annexing Crimea and uh, starting a conflict, uh, you know, on Russia's borders. So basically it's... Um, it's the way they see the world. They see it in, in terms of conflict, and then that's, that's the, they think they're good at it. That's the one thing they're good at is, is fighting. Well, uh, on the other hand, uh, didn't, didn't Putin completely uh, underestimate uh, Chancellor Merkel? I mean, well, there are many things he underestimated. He underestimated the existence of a uh, Ukrainian nation also. Well, he's, he's, he's precipitated this now. Yeah, yeah but he, you see, he's, actually mean, the mass, he's actually the champion of the Ukrainian uh, yeah, you uh, see nation. The, uh, uh, I think Ivan touched on it uh, yesterday. Uh, there's this, where it, I think it's, it's important to understand that, uh, yes, there's a certain way the Kremlin views the world. And, uh, um, and uh, Ivan said yesterday that this thing about the hybrid war, mm. it originated in a very weird way because uh, Gerasimov, the, the Russian general Gerasimov, published his piece. He was writing about the other guy, the West, mm -hmm. doing these things. Yeah. And then the West and the American generals were reading this and, and saying, this is the Gerasimov doctrine. So this is the way Russia wants to do things. And then uh, the American generals uh, said, used the word hybrid, uh, used the expression hybrid war. Mm -hmm. And then the Russians started using it uh, because it, it, Gerasimov doesn't mention it uh, in, in his text. It, is, it didn't exist actually uh, in, a, in a kind of, in, a, in this colloquial way in Russia. So then uh, the expression uh, mm. went back to Russia and now Russia was saying that America is doing mm -hmm. this hybrid war against, yes. uh, against us. Yeah. So it's, it's crazy. It's this complete, uh, it's this, you know, Russia mi is mirroring. Yes. The, it thinks, let's say Moscow, not Russia. I'm Russian, but, uh, uh, you know, Moscow, Moscow is ruled by a certain group of people and that's their thinking. Um, yeah, so, and they constantly mirror that's, that's the way they, they function. Mm. They, you know, wake up in the morning and see, uh, you know, we want to, what are they doing th today? No, we want, to, we want to get back on them. Um, there's, there's a lot of improvisation. Yes, in, in, this is rather dangerous. I mean, uh, uh, think about, think about uh, uh, spending 50 billion, 5 oh billion uh, on Sochi. And yeah. then the next week starting a war. There was, mm. a, there was an element of improvisation. Of course, any general staff has plans. Mm. 
and, and, and to implement those plans was the decision, by, uh, decision made by Putin. But th this, is, this is something which, uh, uh, could we talk about modernization, go back to modernization? Very because, uh, briefly, because I want to open this because, up to the audience. Because, because uh, Max said something that all Russian rulers have been ambitious and it's been stop and go, mm. and after, uh, uh, just think about, uh, starting with Peter, you can, you can I mean, uh, well, the best example is Nicholas I, mm. and, and his uh, son who unexpected, Alexander II, Alex, unexpected. Ivan the Terrible, uh, uh, yes, the yes. founder of the well, Russian state. You, you have, have all of them, it was the but, but the fact is that real modernization happens only if there's a real crisis, or if, at, when the ruler, ruler is changed. This is this is this is the this is the uh, I mean this is the, the uh, this seems to be uh, something which you can you, you can you can uh, extract out of Russian history. It's very interesting. It's a pity this exhibition isn't here. 800 years of German-Russian relations, which was in the the Alta Gallery and for all of us, and the, this, this, the wooden there was a wooden cutting a wood cutting of the German the, the Hanseatic merchants all dressed in furs dealing with rather poorly dressed Russian traders selling animal carcasses and so on. And it was, you saw the, the, the relationship then, and now look what it's like. I'd like to, I'm going to keep the very last question till the very end. In the meantime, I'd like to open up the floor and um, I'll take two, three questions at a time, firstly. Secondly, you're to identify yourselves. And please, 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 we have so little time. One question, keep it precise. And um, as an exception, you could do a statement, but I'm not very fond of this. Okay, um, you were first, Anders was second, and the Latvian, I'm going to make a mistake, uh, Lithuanian ambassador was third. I, I have you down for the third round. So, these two gentlemen here and the Lithuanian ambassador, please. Now remember. Hello, Abdul Hamid Kırmızı from Istanbul Şehir University. I'm a historian. Um, okay. I really it's a bit big. Could you talk a bit louder? Thank you. Uh, I'm trying to understand what you mean by modernization after all these post-colonial critiques, after Sayyid's Orientalism, after Chakrabarti's provincializing uh, Europe, after Humi Baba's writings. I mean, yeah. is modernizing modernization equals uh, with with uh, um, westernization? And if it is westernization. Which West are you? I mean, Good, is yeah. it German modernization, mm. which was spoken of, you know, Zondervik, which yeah, is also no. cr criticized now, or is it British modernization? What is the measure? I mean, is modernization for you a world, a time? Uh, mm. I mean, what is the measure? I mean, uh, the others have to catch up with some imagined modernization, uh -huh. and they are waiting. Uh, they are waiting in a waiting room to be modernized, and isn't is it not? too Eurocentric to think that, um, you know, uh, this narrative of it's only after crisis mm. this modernization mm. happens, etc. Okay. I mean, modernization uh, for me is a world time and yeah. everybody has their own uh, kind of Definition original of indigenous modernizations. Okay. I mean, okay. Important how, question. how do you, yeah. um, I mean, we have yes, to be more concrete we, in concept, I mean, rule of law. Rennie will uh, deal with this. What, what's modernization? That's very, that's very, uh, uh, Anders, please. I just introduced Under the Oslo and the Atlantic Council, isn't it time to stop talking about modernization under Putin altogether and instead wait for the collapse of the regime? Uh, Ambas uh, Ambassador Nyberg touched upon it. Isn't this the end of <laughs> Nikolai uh, I and uh, we are waiting for Alexander II? But worse, uh, <laughs> what I'm missing in this discussion, okay. it is Putin uh -huh. is two Putinism. things combined. Mm organized crime and FSB, KDB. Mm -hmm. Nothing good comes out of that. Yeah. This is a system that cannot be reformed, that can only collapse, that is, has been stagnant since uh, uh, 2009, and the way to defend it is uh, through hybrid warfare. There's not enough uh, yeah. money, so I don't think we should use uh, uh, the new Cold War, which yeah. Edward Lucas introduced in 2008 in his uh, uh, book title, I agree on that, but isn't it time to yeah. wait for the collapse? Thank you. Thanks, Anders, and please, over here, the gentleman standing up, the Lithuanian ambassador, and keep it. Uh, Mr. Trudeau, uh, I understand you, you mentioned that there is a perception. Could you, per, uh, could you um, I, I'm Lithuanian ambassador here in Berlin, Darius Semoshka. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mr. Trudeau, Lubov mentioned that there is a problem of perception on both sides, that who named what and who was the first 
And uh, as if that, I understood that uh, you, you, you say that there is a real problem of perception. So do you believe that uh, Russian current government regime really considered 100 times smaller defense capacities in the Baltics uh, as a real threat to Russia? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, that's it. We're going to have... Um, I think let's deal with the rounds of three. I have you on the list. Um, so, oh, wow. So, um, what does it mean, modernization? Great question. Anders, well, I, I'm not allowed to agree, but I agree with you. <laughs> and, uh, and the Baltic states, um, you know, are you... Cutting it shortly, are you a threat? Uh, right. Time to ditch modernization, or what does it mean, briefly? Uh, this is not semantics. I have nothing more to say about modernization. This is not semantics. There are real issues, there are real structures which, are, which are, uh, date from the deep Soviet times, which will not stand, uh, uh, will stand in, in modern times. Uh, there's a, uh, we were, Anders and I shared a, shared, a, shared, a, shared a conference back in Washington some time ago where, some, where, where somebody said, uh, Pat put, put the question the following way, are there ghosts in the Kremlin? And said, yes, there are two ghosts. The first is the ghost of a man who tried and failed to reform the system. His name is Gorbachev. And the second ghost is smaller. That's the man who, 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 uh, who who opened up for, for ideas and, 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 and hopes which he could not fulfill, and that's Medvedev. And the result was that, that people went to the streets and they blamed Putin. On the Baltics, I, I, don't, I, mean the, uh, I think that the, one of the great achievements of post-Soviet world is the three Baltic states having shown that they can, they can do it, they can make it, they've, they've, and they've arrivé, they, they've really done it. The, the, if, you, if we take the Russian mind, which I'm, I, I don't pretend to be, a, be an, a, a good interpreter of, but I might have an insight, I would say that the Russians, the Kremlin has accepted that the three Baltic states are, are not part of, of, of their... Uh, you remember the old expression of near abroad? It's not used anymore. But on the other hand, you, you, you wonder, is the security vacuum really filled? Has NATO really filled the security vacuum uh, in the Baltic states? Um, thanks, Rene. Um, Max. Um, well, um, modernization. Um, well, I find, well, for example, you know, James Scott's book, Seeing Like a State, I find it really helpful in, in uh, describing what you could see as a modernization. Stalin was a great modernizer, and most of the Soviet uh, industry was built by Americans and Germans, uh, designed and, and, uh, and then, I mean, the actual factories and were built by uh, poor Russian peasants who were basically not paid for it. And, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, and lived in, um, and lived in huts, uh, uh, anyway, so, so this is modernization, and, um, uh, and um, this is what uh, James Scott called high modernism, right? That was the uh, 20th century kind of uh, modernization. And I would, as a Russian, as a, as, you know, from my perspective, I would say that I don't want this kind of modernization anymore. Any, uh, we've, we've tried it, and uh, this, I think, uh, is, is kind of a Russian historical... Uh, you know, like a, like a constant, like a, in a way, like a disease of the Russian character that we always been modernizing ourselves and often in these kinds of ways. But to say this, doesn't, it, it doesn't mean that, uh, you know, you have to do the things that, the kinds of things that uh, the current Russian regime is doing. Of course, I mean, I'm just saying that, you see, and uh, you have a very good point, Anders, in saying that uh, the West should probably stop talking about helping uh, Russia mm. modernize. It's kind of, do it does sound weird. Uh, and, um, but um, on the other hand, again, as a Russian, I'm not comfortable with the idea of a collapse. Mm. Uh, uh, you see, um, I've seen a collapse. Uh, I was... Uh, about 20 years old, uh, finishing, uh, no, actually, uh, anyway, finishing school, and, I, and uh, I saw people of my parents' age 
losing their jobs, losing their place in life completely. Uh, you know, they've, they woke up in a different world. Uh, it, to many of them, a hostile, a very hostile place. Uh, the money, the new realities, mm. the markets, mm. everything has a price. It didn't have... So, I mean, we, w we, we will never have anything like it. In, uh, we'll, if a collapse happens, we will have something else. Mm. But uh, the, the, the depth of this human tragedy was real. And uh, you don't really want a collapse. And, and in my thinking, I would, I would say that I... I actually think that the, the current, Russia's current rulers uh, are doing a very bad thing because they are actually probably driving Russia to, a, to a some, kind of, some kind of a crisis. And that's why they're, they're very, very wrong because, uh, because you know, the, the way the system, the way the, the events go, they, they kind of, yes, a collapse is one possible scenario, but uh, hopefully not the only one. Thanks for, for that, um, that point, Max. Uh, you're, you're number, I've, I've got four on this round. Uh, num number one, um, n n n please, you first. And this gentleman at the back. Dr. Semini from Kyiv. I have actually one question to both of the participants, but firstly, I should comment that if we're taking the title Cold War II, mm. it is exactly not a fully analogy, but nevertheless, we have quite a few elements from Cold War, plus uh, you mentioned exactly Cold Warriors uh, in the both sides, Western Russia. Unfortunately, I see that we are moving step by step. Uh, we are not until there uh, to the situation when both parties probably will be ready to kill each other. Until now, we are not situation, but we should prevent. And the question is, and especially for you, Mr. Newberg, as far as you are from the country, uh, who was, I would say, on the edge during Cold War, who profited from this position, being neither fully part of the West because due to the Soviet Union on the border and finding many compromises? And the question is now, there is a concept of so-called countries in between. Yeah. How do you see both, that's, that's, that's Marx and Mr. Nürburgring, how do you see the role of these countries okay. under all current yeah. circumstances, be it yeah. the role of the territories and countries yeah. to be contested that's between two, or maybe some kind of productive role, be it initiative from these countries to stop confrontation, yeah. or some agreement between Thank two you. parties? Yeah, it's very important, the lands between, and I'm glad you brought them up. We have a gentleman, the gentleman back here, please, who was there. Uh, was it, I think it was you at the back? No, no. Oh, well, then, please go. That's please go. That's and then the Armenian, and then uh, the lady at the back. Hello, my name is Jan Lundin. Do you hear me? Yeah. So, my name is Jan Lundin. I'm, um, I'm a Swedish diplomat. I spent most of the 90s in, 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 in Russia, in Moscow. It was uh, tough times. Um, um, I, I'm, I'm now ambassador um, in, in Serbia. But, but um, uh, so, so I, a very quick reflection on, on modernization, which, which I, th I found Mr. Trubaljubo's uh, expose uh, very interesting, is that uh, if you look at economic history and you compare the UK and Russia, I think you will find that Russia is always lagging behind with the generation, behind the UK in terms of GDP per capita, but never, never more. You know, it takes a generation to mm -hmm. catch up, and then they're there, and then the UK is 25 years ahead anyway. But, but and regardless of the political system, I find that imp interesting, and it, it says something about globalization's effects on yeah. Russia. Then, but my question is, yes. since we are, we are at a history seminar, I'd like to hear what you think. Uh, you know, if you're a Protestant with roots in northern Sweden, you tend to think when there's a conflict, then maybe you, you have done something wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so what did the West do wrong then? Okay. Uh, <laughs> since 1989. What, okay. what was the West's uh, self-criticism here? Mm -hmm. Can you engage so, in a bit of self-criticism? Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Very. Um, um, colleague from Armenia, but please keep it short. Please. Please. Thank you very much. Yes, yeah, I'll be very brief. Uh, Ambassador, you, you said that Russia is a world champion. Your name, please. Oh, sorry, Stefan Safarian from Armenia. Uh, Ambassador, you said that uh, Russia is a world champion in modernization. I said if that. we look, at, sorry, I said that. Uh, you said, uh, if we look at the um, history of Russia, uh, all attempts were ended up with with uh, revolution or counter-revolution. So, do you expect that this stage will uh, also lead to that kind of hmm. uh, outcome? Okay. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very much. Ah, <laughs> and there was a lady back here. Uh, yes, please. Then we go run through these questions. 
Alexander Setenko, doctoral student, University of Leipzig. I also wanted to ask regarding their Cold War analogy. I mean, it's evident that uh, we cannot speak uh, about the uh, new Cold War because it was a great deal of a systemic constellation, and today it's not a bipolar system, but, but a multipolar system. Nevertheless, there is one element today that was crucial during the Cold War in the 20th century, and that is very important today. It's a big uh, degree of distrust yeah. among Russia and the West. So, uh, do you think mm. uh, this mistrust can be overcome? Okay. And if yes, um, which trust building measures are necessary? Okay. I'm glad you bring this up because this is one of the list of the mistrust. Yeah. Um, okay, the four, four questions. We need, need very quick answers. Sorry about this. Lands between, um, the, uh, what did the West do wrong? Um, the, um, the, the Cold I'll leave War. That for a mark. Uh, the, the mistrust, the mistrust, and the other one was the. Finland. Um, Finland, yes. Finland. Yeah, off you go. Go on, Rene. <laughs> right. Uh, in uh, 2002, I was the ambassador in Moscow. The, uh, the former president, Koivisto, came, came to present his book. He'd written an essay about Russian history, uh, uh, the Russian story, kind of, and, and a very, very, uh, very uh, uh, well-written uh, thing about starting with, with the Mongols and, and with, with Ivan and all of that. And, 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 this, and the, and the uh, Russian journalist who interviewed him, uh, actually in Russian, he spoke well Russian, uh, which, is, which is rare in, in, uh, in today's Finland, asked him at the end, what is the, f what is the Finnish story? And the old, old president who was in, uh, pushing 80 at that time said without hesitating a second in Russian, to, 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 to survive. Mm. And, and we survived because we fought. Mm. This is the big difference. And we were not occupied. Yeah, exactly. And then after that, we dealt with Stalin in peacetime, and we dealt with the heirs of Stalin. And just remember that. They were all heirs of Stalin. They were all, Khrushchev had blood up to his elbows. Uh, uh, you had Brezhnev who, be, who started with Stalin. So that was, that was a, but we never, did mm. not miss a single train in joining the European integration right. system, mm. and then finally. Mm. It's very important. And your middle class wasn't destroyed in the Second World War. We, very we important. were, I mean, then, uh, I, mean yeah. if, uh, I don't want we, to uh, uh, go, on. Uh, go on with this, but the, the fact is that Finland is an example of a country where the army protected its civilian population. Um, thanks, Rene. The lands between, I want to deal with the lands between, but particularly this last question, how do we, the, the Cold War, um, well, the West, what are the West mistakes? Rene, I'll have to ask you about the West. Uh, That's a very Protestant. What's the, right. what, what, the West, uh, what the West did wrong? Did we? Uh, well, uh, you see, it's a Western question. Yeah. It is. Yeah. It is. You see, um, <laughs> uh, I've, I've never heard this question in Russia. Um, yeah. you, you see, I mean, I, I've read about it, I think uh, George Soros was one of the first to 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 write about to say this. Uh, who lost Russia? Yeah. It was it was still in the 90s. Yeah. So it was, uh, and I am sure there were. There, it has been. It, it was said even before. So um, you see, I, uh, m most of the things you know right now, Russia is. Uh, Moscow is saying that uh, you know the NATO enlargement, mm. the EU enlargement, the institutions of the West encroaching on Russia, etc. But uh, the way I remember it uh, is that uh, essentially Moscow has changed the narrative. That's what happened, because the narrative back in the 90s was very, very different, and essentially it was a story of Russia um, changing itself. Uh, Russia made mistakes, uh, the Soviet system didn't work, we want to find a different system, etc., etc. There were all kinds of arguments, but there was a certain understanding mm. behind it mm. that uh, Russia made some mistakes. Uh, what Putin did, he changed the narrative completely. It was not, there were no mistakes, essentially. Mm. The yeah. Soviet Union collapsed because of a hostile uh, hostile activity of the West, undermined um, by the West. And this has changed everything. A lot of people are buying, have bought into this mm. because it's a simple story and it, it's kind of, it's easy to connect mm -hmm. to. 
and you don't have to blame yourself, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. It's a very convenient story. And everything else has been built on top of this. So uh, right now, I think, I, I hope, we are actually about to witness a crisis of this narrative. Because this narrative has been already yeah. quite old, I mean, since Putin arrived, yeah, exactly. almost 20 years. Yeah. Um, Rennie has to go uh, uh, immediately at one minute past 12. Um, I think that the, the element of the distrust uh, goes back to our very original question. How do we, if there is distrust, how do we overcome this distrust given what Russia has done in Crimea, in Syria, what it's doing with Turkey, what it's doing in eastern Ukraine? How, how, how uh, do you agree there's distrust and how can, how can it be overcome? Are we just, as Anders says, let, let uh, the Putin era run its course. Well, I mean, uh, you've got there's no, 30 there's, seconds. There's, right, there's no short answer, uh, mm. answer to that. I mean, we, we, we have to keep trading, we have to keep talking, we have to, to keep, keep, keep relations, and we have to make an effort to, to, to understand where we do not understand things, mm. I mean, the, the narrative. And I think, uh, I think that the fact that the narratives are, uh, we're talking past each other, yes. and we have to fight back. It's we absolutely. have to fight back. This is important. We have to fight back. We have to fight back. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, force, uh, force. Uh, I mean, information war things, and we have to make sure that we have we have the defense capability right. we need in order to make sure that no, nobody uh, uh, underestimates us. Well, it'll be interesting to see what happens to Finland's neutrality. I remember Chancellor Merkel describing. Her relations that 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 Putin lives on a different planet in a completely no, I mean, different I mean, world. We're, 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 we're very happy with the situation well, we have that's now. That's another issue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. because, because I mean, what, what we have, we're an, we're a partner of NATO. Indeed, we're, uh, we have an intensive and successful uh, military cooperation mm. with Sweden, and we are a military technical partner of the United States. Yes. And indeed, uh, all this propaganda against Finland is, is totally... There's no, there's no, no from propaganda the, from the against Finland. From the, from the trolls and others, from the Russian propaganda there is. Um, um, Max, um, this distrust of where, where is this going? I mean, are we, are we into a verbal Cold War? Or, or, or how do you see this relationship developing? Or do we run... The, well, it, as Anders yeah, said, yeah, I, it's, um, it's impossible to deal with. Because, yeah, I, th I think what, if, if, this is, if we call it a Cold War, I mean, again, as I say, it's a very convenient picture for, uh, for Moscow because it, uh, it uh, adds relevance. You know, mm. you become relevant. Incredible. But, uh, but I think that the Cold War itself, the conflict between Russia and uh, the West, represented by the U.S., because for Russia, the U.S. is, is still the, the actual actor. From the Russian point, you have, uh, you know, the world is built by... It consists of a very few centers of power, real sovereign powers. Everyone else is irrelevant. So the U.S., the US from the Moscow view, uh, the U.S. is running Europe and tells people here what to do. And basically, that's why Moscow is fighting the, the U.S. But what I want to say is basically this, if this is a Cold War, it's becoming itself, it's kind of uh, becoming irrelevant because the, every, the world is too large by now. The rest of the world is too large and important. And this conflict mm. is kind of gradually getting into irrelevance. And, uh, you know, uh, basically the winners, I think, are outside of this, cold, if it's a Cold War. The, the, the winning uh, parties are China, Asia uh, in, uh, uh, at large, and other developing, growing uh, nations and economies, while Russia and the U.S. are engaged in the weirdest of mm. uh, conflicts mm. that has very little substance behind it. It has a lot of, uh, well, uh, I won't use the word, but uh, it's, you know, it's this kind of disdain for truth, and it's, it's completely artificial, a lot of it. Re considering uh, the American politics uh, too, not just Russian thank, politics. Uh, thank you both very much for trying to link Russia with history, with modernization, with what has happened over, over the past couple of decades. We could have gone on for another couple of hours, but sure. there's other interesting panels. Thank you both very much and for the audience participation.